Hello and welcome to the talk Porting Mandel Linux to Mobile Phones at Fostum 2022. My name is Luca Weiss and I've been main Linux phones since about 2017. I'm also a PostMarketer's core team member <laughs> and also OpenRazor maintained and other contributions online uh, and free software. And at work, I'm a Android platform engineer at Fairphone where I'm basically working on extending the life of mobile phones. So let's start. Um, with the current situation, um, on the right you can see kind of a graph um, how kernel development works in the normal Android market. So it starts off, um, like Linux itself starts off even one layer above as um, like the Linux mainline, how we call it, or how it is called. Um, and um, also in this talk I will be referring a lot to like downstream, um, which is describing the kernel that gets shipped with a with a mobile phone. So it starts off um, like a particular kernel version gets branched into the Linux long-term supported release, for example, the 4.19 release. This then gets modified by Google in the so-called Android common kernel. This then again gets modified by the um, SOC manufacturer, for example, Qualcomm or MediaTek, and they add um, very um, SOC specific drivers on top of this. And then um, a device manufacturer gets this kernel and modifies it again um, and adds like device specific drivers on top. As you can imagine, um, there, because of this situation, like every more or less every device in, in existence has their own kernel and their own kernel sources, and they aren't shared with, with anything, which also means that security issues needs to be need to be patched in like every single one of those re of those kernels if it is supposed to be or if it's still supposed to be secure. Um, it's also very worth noting that Greg Crow Hartman, the Linux stable maintainers, like from the, in this graphic, the, the top layer, um, um, often says that um, there aren't like really security fixes. So I mean, there are fixes that fix obvious security problems, but that also all other fixes that fix something should be applied. But this in this model doesn't really happen because manufacturers only and also Google and um, and the SOC manufacturer only apply fixes more or less that have a CVE number attached. And this just isn't the case. And sometimes like it takes a year until the CVE number is out there. Um, but the patch has been available like one year earlier and it could have been fixed already. This um, so, so this whole situation just means that there's a lot of out, out of tree code. So that's not in the air. Upper layer LTS, which is branched from the actual mainline tree, and also some of the drivers are just of really questionable code quality, which <laughs> you don't really want to look at them. So, um, yeah, the, um, to explain a bit the licensing situation there, um, Linux kernel itself is licensed under GPL 2.0. So that means every modified Linux kernel where existing GPL code has been modified has to be open source as well. Um, some vendors don't really care about this anyways, but this is um, another topic. I'm talking about the ones that uh, where the kernel is open source and it has to be open source. One thing people often get wrong is that SOC, um, that there's like proprietary kernel modules. And this, ex this exists to some extent. For example, XFAT um, drivers do exist that are proprietary, but this is very much the exception. And most of the drivers that actually get used in the device are open source in the kernel. But SOC manufacturers um, like to implement drivers in user space. I'm not exactly sure why, but I guess it gets around like the, the GPL license re requirement. It's also maybe easier to hire people. Um, this applies to like camera driver, Bluetooth driver, and, and other drivers. But most of these drivers have some kind of kernel component that at least um, acts as a shim to, um, to forward a request from user space to the actual hardware through the kernel. Um, it's also very much worth noting that Qualcomm has some open source user space high parts, but there are also very important bits that are proprietary and you, you cannot um, look at them and modify them. This basically means that building a 100% open source system with this kernel is more or less impossible. Ubuntu Touch does att attempts like part of it um, to, to open source the user space part or the non-hardware abstraction stuff user space. Um, via um, reusing Android libraries, and this um, goes via Libibris, which is an awesome piece of software. Um, and you can see that Ubuntu Touch very much works. 
but it does have the proprietary um, user space demons and libraries that unfortunately are necessary when you use the downstream kernel. And yeah, this can be solved by using a um, kernel with proper interfaces. So let's talk about a bit, bit about x86. Um, to be fair, I don't really know much about x86. Like, or my 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 laptop and whatever is x86. But other than that, I haven't been really involved in kernel development there. But generally, ACPI, which is Advanced Configuration Power Interface, exists um, on x86 and x and ACPI tables. Um, it's a standard that exists for like 20 years um, now that's used to discover and configure hardware components. But basically um, on x86, the BIOS provides these ACPI tables, which is a description of the hardware. And um, then the, the kernel knows like um, how to begin the initialization of everything, how to talk to the devices. Um, what's also different on, on laptops compared to mobile phones is that a lot of um, the hardware um, is on USB or PCI bus which is an enumerable bus. Um, so you can, ba so basically the host can ask like around like, hey, who's there? And then all of the devices respond. So for example, on my laptop, the touchpad, SD card reader webcam is on USB bus, um, on, on PCI's Wi-Fi card, even at control and GPU. And all of these, uh, all of these two buses um, use, uh, use a vendor ID product ID combination to identify a particular device for example in the screenshot on the top on the bottom right uh, you can see an abbreviated version of the of the match table basically um for my um ethernet um pci card on my laptop and it's basically just matches the, the vendor id of realtech which is behind the macro here and then the product id of hex 8168 and this just tells uh, um, the kernel like which um, which driver it can use for this and for USB, um, also a lot of um, standard USB device classes exist um, for various components. But for example, that's why you can plug in every keyboard and every mouse to a, to a computer, because the, um, it is based around the standard and there's just not really much to, to the device, to be honest. Okay, so so why is it difficult in ARM? Um, first of all, yeah, it doesn't use ACPI, which is not really the the thing why it's difficult but it's just different um like historically um so like back in the two point whatever days the linux two point um x days um linux on arm used board files which was a way of um, writing a c file that um, contains the description of the hardware and this was then statically built into the kernel but this of course meant that the kernel was only um possible to run this kernel on one particular device because it was statically built into it um, since about Linux 3. Point something, um, like device trees have really taken off, um, which is a technology originally from Spark, and it's in part of the Open Firmware project. When you look into the code, you can often see like the OF underscore um, prefix. This is Open Firmware, but it's another word for device tree, let's say. And it's a structured way to describe hardware, and it's used by all of all modern kernels, um, all devices. And it describes things like clocks, GPIO, memory addresses, and much, much more. And then this is this device tree is loaded by a, in theory, um, generic kernel, where the kernel just knows based on this um, device tree, um, like which hardware is available, how to talk to it. And also, it's very much worth noting that device tree is operating system independent. So it's not just a Linux technology, but also, for example, U-Boot uses it, so, which is a bootloader. And also FreeBSD can use, in theory, the exact, the exact same device tree that's, um, that's written, for example, for Linux. Um, but as, as long as FreeBSD implements the same, um, yeah, the same compatibility for this, um, for this device tree, then it works. Okay, so why should we care about mainland Linux? Well, yeah, it's, it's really, a, first of all, it's really a great learning opportunity because you don't really get any insight into um, into phones and ARM, um, otherwise, in my opinion, of course, you can run some, some, some single board computers, but they're also, they're already supported in, in basically all of the cases. <laughs> and there are just so many phones out there and you can pick up a phone for like 15 euros on, uh, on the secondhand market and you can get to work on it. Um, with mainland kernel, you can run. 100% open source user space and kernel on a phone without, um, which is super awesome in my opinion, because yeah, free software. And you can run Postmarket on it, of course, 
very important. Um, but also in projects like, like Mobian, which is uh, like basically a mobile Debian. And also even Android via the AOSPM project. Or um, it's also another project, but I don't recall the name right now. Another point is that the code is maintained on kernel.org centrally, or more or less <laughs> decentralized centrally. Um, but this means that when there's a like a when the code is ugly or the um, or the driver has a bug, then you can fix it and send it upstream to uh, to kernel.org to the maintainers, and then it gets integrated into this one source tree in the end, um, and everybody can benefit from it. Also, by working on mainland Linux for phones, you you really learn valuable engineering skills because um, every time you do something more or less on, on the device, you're debugging. You're debugging why it doesn't work. You're debugging and diving into the kernel subsystems and hopefully fixing your problem. And well, more, maybe most important, you can brag about it online because um, you get into the like hall of the hall of fame of um, the Linux Git history. Okay, so um, I'm going to be focusing on Qualcomm on this talk, uh, but it's um, because I personally have the most experience with it. It's probably also the best mainstream SOC vendor um, that you can use here because, um, yeah, because there's kind of Qualcomm and MediaTek and MediaTek doesn't have as much um, support there. Also, when you work on a device, the age of the device matters in two ways um, because New SSCs, um, they do have many of the basics already working by paid people, for example, by people from the company Linaro, um, where uh, big companies pay them to work on these features for mainline. On the other hand, on, on old SSCs, um, it, they, the coders had a lot more time to mature and to iron out bugs and to, to get features. Um, so there you might have more references like um, how things can work and there are more similar SOCs and more similar devices already implemented. So you can look at other devices and see um, what the differences are. I'm also not going to be focusing on SOC bring up because that's, um, I, I definitely wouldn't recommend this at first target because you have to, load, to get a lot of the basics done, like pin control, base um, clocks and some other drivers that you really don't want to have as your first experience there. There, there, are, there are definitely very many SOCs um, out there, um, even just by one company. Um, and there's definitely not a lot, not a lot of them su supported. There might be some work for most of them, but um, it's in some cases very minimal. Um, there are some, some great SOCs to get started with. For example, the um, for Qualcomm, the MSM8916, so Snapdragon 410, has super great support, like one of the best supports. Uh, Snapdragon 845 is also great, um, also is good support, but many other SOCs in between um, are also well supported. Generally, high-end SOCs are more supported than um, like the mid-range or lower end because just um, more people are kind of enthusiastic about it and focus on that more, I think. Okay, so what do you need for it? Um, Unlock bootloader, which, is, which would be useful um, to flash your own software on it. Also keep the stock firmware um, prepared because if you uh, if you break something or whatever, then you want to have like an image to go back onto. It's also very useful for charging the battery because in the in the start you definitely won't have or in most cases you won't have um, the battery be charged um, while mainline is running because the charging controller just isn't set up yet and the driver's missing. So. Um, try to reboot um, into Android like every whatever time um, and see what the charging percent, uh, what the battery percentage is and then charge the battery again there um, to make sure that it doesn't run flat because there's also no protection against running the battery like lower than 0% until like the the voltage is too low for actually the SSC to be alive. And this is not good for the battery also in either. Um, TWP, um, Team Win uh, Recovery Project, is very nice um, because it's just one um, boot image and you can boot this and then have an ver a very uncomplicated environment where you can try different things in there. You should also know like what the device can do, especially like, if you pick up a second-hand device, um, like if it has NFC, video audible, USB-C, whatever. It's very useful to know um, because I've... <laughs> I've had it a couple of times where I didn't really know like what the device can actually do. Um, so 
Yeah, do this. Half the downstream kernel source is ready. So the, the one that Android chips with, um, because you often want to modify them to check something in, uh, in downstream, uh, add some debug statements to find out how the, how the code works. Also if the device is UART, which, um, most, okay, maybe not most devices, some devices have, um, some devices have very hidden some on the board. But if if you have access or find online where how to access it, it would be super useful because um, you will have much less trouble debugging some some um, annoying problems with that. Okay, um, yeah, I'm going to briefly go over this. Um, basically, in in downstream kernel or for example even in TWRP, uh, just go um, find out like which. Um, which devices there are and which drivers are used, for example, um, find which input device is for a touchscreen and for the volume buttons and for the um, and for the other buttons. Um, this is dev input. You can use EV test, for example. Um, also, for example, vibration motor or um, Wi-Fi chipset. Uh, for all the backlight um, things and LEDs, you can mostly find um, like find sys slash minus uh, dash minus name dash minus name minus name uh, brightness uh, and then you can find like the different drivers that are currently active um but in downstream like always many more drivers are active and actually pretending to be there um, even though they actually don't do anything so for example for the brightness files you can just echo like a number to it um that's lower than lower equals max brightness which is a different file and mostly the same directory um and then just see like what actually happens with this. So um, on newer devices, it's a bit annoying to extract the pre-built DTB, so the, the, the device tree from Android, which is different to the one that you want to have in mainline, because um, newer devices have DTBO partition, which is device tree binary overlay, uh, where like the normal DTB from boot image and the DTBO gets combined to actually um, from the full device that's actually then passed to the kernel. Um, basically, you can find, you can find the, like the full device that's actually running on the device um, on, in Sys firmware. Um, and you can use DTC to actually get kind of a, a textual form of the device tree back. Um, there, there will be some um, some references already like resolved, um, which will be very ugly to look at. So also keep the original DTS handy um, to look at. Okay, so um, we start with putting something simple, if possible. Um, AK second is a second stage bootloader, um, which is available for some SOCs. This is super simple to bring up on the devices where it works, uh, or on this SOC where it's available. Uh, you just have kind of 10 lines of extra changes um, in there, and then it's booting on the device, and you don't really have to know much about it. Um, this is super useful because bootloaders Stock bootloaders are very annoying sometimes to deal with. Um, they, um, yeah, you really have to, to learn to live with them because you can't really change them. Um, yeah, you also have to get the QCOM board ID and, or QCOM MSM ID correct, the DTPO partition, which is, again, super annoying in some cases. Sometimes you can just erase it and then the bootloader doesn't complain. On some devices, it complains extremely badly and you need to flash like a, uh, a little fake DTBO on there, which also doesn't work on all devices. So it, it might get tricky there. And again, with, without UART, you might need to do some guessing because over UART, you mostly get like the reason why it doesn't boot, but on like on, on via USB on like when you do fast boot boot or whatever, and you don't really get any output there, except like maybe DTBO not found, but a DTB not found, um, but you don't really know like what's actually going on. And you really have to get, learn to live with the bootload and learn to love it. <laughs> okay, um, so this is an example from uh, a device tree, like an excerpt um, from downstream, which defines the a touchscreen node. And you can see in the top, um, it's in the node SOC, which is um, a subnode of the root node, where basically all devices with a memory address kind of are in there. You can see there's a uh, I2C bus on the address um, hex f 99 um, And this is also defined in another file. 
and it gets merged together by the device tree compiler. And then you have a node, um, the elitech one, that has a compatible string which um, describes the. It's basically a, an identifier, um, similar to the um, USB vendor ID product ID that I mentioned before. It's just a string that um, uh, contains from the vendor, comma, then the kind of the model name or something. And this describes in this example the Elitech Eli2120 touchscreen. Um, REC is in in the in I2C bus is the I2C address, so it's the address hex 41. Um, the device has some interrupts, um, which is um, here spread amongst two lines. Um, it's the interrupt 28, and you can see here also like the first annoying part. Um, it it only says hex two. Um, for the second number and this is actually the um, as you can see in the bottom right it's IRQ type edge falling which is um, a way to describe how an interrupt interrupts the, the kernel to um, or how the device interrupts the kernel not really super important to know but it's very um, very important to know that um, in downstream in many cases these aren't described properly or beautifully Let's say it works um, because the, it's a define, so it gets replaced afterwards with two anyways. Um, but it's a bit annoying to, to read. The next line, we have a power supply defined for the device, which is PM8941S3. And this supplies power to the device. Um, it's not really, yeah, I won't go into detail here now because I don't have the time. But it's it basically, yeah, it supplies power as, uh, as the name suggests. Then we also have some uh, some GPOs here, so a reset GPO, um, the number 55 on the MSM GPO bus. Um, again, here you can see um, hex 00, which is actually the GPO active high flag. Um, and reset GPOs are very common, especially in I2C buses, um, which can reset device. And most importantly, um, the kernel has to in most cases, um, drive the GPO high from the default um, to actually enable the device and that you can communicate via I2C to it. You can also see the interrupt um, 28 is defined again for some reason. The driver wants it apparently. Um, and then we have another power enabled GPO, which is a different GPO that does something. And without reading documentation here, you don't really know why, uh, why what it's doing. Okay, and fortunately in mainline there um, there is actually a driver for us, so you can as you can see next to the red arrow, um, ELI two one two zero, the same name as we had in the previous slide, is actually supported. And this is this is the file in documentation slash device slash bindings um, in mainline, and you can see um, all the properties defined that are um, implemented in the driver, and also see an example there. And we can basically use the the um, the format from and the supported properties from the from the um, documentation that we had, and write our own um, device tree node for mainline. You can see we are in the same I2C bus, so the same hex F992400, and we have to enable this um, this bus because it's disabled by default in most cases. Then we add um, the compatible string, which is um, a bit different from downstream, but it's um, uh, it's the one that's documented in the documentation for mainline. Um, same rec, so same I to C address, with the same same interrupt again, but this time with a proper constant, you, so you can actually like a bit better understand what's going on, and some just a magic constant. And we also have the, the reset GPO again, same GPO, same um, again with the constant properly replaced. And also the we don't have to power this power GPO from the from two slides before. Um, because it's not needed apparently for this one. And it, the device just works fine with this and then with the touchscreen working. Sometimes unfortunately it's a bit more difficult. Um, in this example, we have uh, a node that's, it's the, the compatible Skook Nitrous. From looking at it, you have no clue what's going on. BT might suggest it's, it's Bluetooth and it's actually, um, yeah, it is a Bluetooth definition for a device. Um, this one is defined um, without um, reference to the UART port, because um, Bluetooth mostly goes um, has to transport it via UART. 
um, but it just has, has an obscure like UART part equals zero, whatever this means when you look at it, where we see some GPOs defined and also like host wake polarity, which is probably just a weird way of describing like if it's an active high or active low GPO. Uh, but yeah, with this UART part zero and because um, in in there is no other UART enabled other than this, um, this UART zero, um, is um, has this memory address and this is very useful to know for implementing this main London and using the correct GPO there with the correct driver. Can also be even more worse. Um, in this example, the um, the Wi-Fi driver is actually not registered in device tree, but in a board file. And we talked about this earlier a bit. The, the super old thing that you don't really want to use anymore. For some reason, um, the manufacturer decided, hey, it's a good idea to register this in a board file. Um, we can see in this code example, which is from this .c file, um, there's actually like the two GPOs defined that we need for mainline. So the power GPO and host spec GPO. And um, based on um, going through the downstream um, kernel log, so the MESG, um, we have determined that it's most likely um, on this SDHC3 bus, which is on address F9864900. And with this, we can again um, write our mainline device definition there. So if you want to get more uh, components supported, then a structured to-do to -do list is very useful. Um, for example, Kanban board, if you want to. Can also go through the downstream DTS to see like what you're missing there, um, because there are a lot of non-user facing components like PRNG, which is a pseudo random number generator, um, which is super useful you know, to to have on the device, but you probably won't really think about it when you think about a phone. Hey, okay, it has a, it has a screen that has buttons, it has a camera. Um, but um, in downstream, you can also ignore like the SOC debug things because there are a lot of things there, for example, core side and some other bits um, that you that you probably cannot use because you don't have the test boards, you don't have the hardware, you don't have the software for it, and it's just um, yeah, there's not really a point in in trying to implement this. Um, also, an important tip is you can really compare downstream versus mainline to understand like what's going on, what other people did. Um, if you look at, um, so for example, if your kernel tree has a also support for a, um, for an SOC that's or for a device that's already implemented in mainline, you can see like uh, um, you can look at downstream and then try to understand like um, like where the values in mainline are coming from, make notes for this, and then. Um, yeah, and you can try to add support for your variant. Some more tips, because tips can never be enough said. Keep notes. Um, you, you will want to reference them later again. Um, if there's some error in the log and you, you're you working on this, put in that put into a text file and, and save it. Save your kernel config. Um, this is didn't do in the beginning. I spent many hours trying to figure out like why it was randomly not working anymore, the driver. Um, and you can really uh, been so many hours and doing nothing and, and finding out, oh, I didn't enable this driver or something else. It's super annoying sometimes. Kernel commander is the same. Um, it probably gets modified a bit less, but if sometimes there are some flags you need to use for the device to actually boot and some things to work. Um, there are also some useful command line options for bring up, for example, CLK ignore unused, which doesn't disable unused clocks, so which don't get referenced in the device tree. So also PD ignore unused, which is a bit less relevant. It's uh, in this power domain field, which is a bit like the regulators. It doesn't disable those if the kernel doesn't, uh, if the kernel thinks it's not needed. Because if you don't do that for power savings, it's just it's disabling those. Um, sometimes in data sheets, I2C addresses are written a bit weirdly. There's like, a, for example, um, it says like, okay, use um, use address uh, hex 50 for reading and hex 51 for writing. Um, and this is the it's like the, the eight bit format, um, but in mainline the seven bit format gets used. 
Um, so then this example is uh, hex 28. So you just take either one of the two numbers. So either 50 or 51 hex, uh, shift in one, one bit to the right, and you get hex 28, which is like the proper address because the, the last bit um, actually gets set like in I to see um, if it's getting read or written um, on the bus, but it's not relevant um, for, yeah. So just use the, the seven bit format because the eight bit one doesn't work. Um, yeah, um, if you, um, devices with the same SOC are often very similar. Um, that's, um, that's because kind of Qualcomm provides a reference design to OEMs, which they base their devices on. So, um, and sometimes the vendors don't really modify much of it. So in many cases, like, um, the touchscreen will be on the same I2C bus, the, um, the sensors, um, okay, sensors are a different topic again. Um, but regulators, um, internal storage and whatever, they're, they're most likely very similar between, um, devices with the same SOCs. Um, so look at other devices and see what it's done there. And again, compare with downstream and see what's going on. And if you encounter weird downstream device to note, there's like, there might be documentation in the, in the kernel sources for this, um, for this, um, driver which might um, help you understand um, the, some, some of the properties better. There are super handy hardware utilities available on the market um, for super m uh, little money. For example, USB meter, um, which is the one on the top right, which basically just shows you how much power is going through a USB cable. Um, and if you can see in this example, 0 0.33 amps, and it's kind of like a stay alive charge because the device mostly uses that much power. Um, if it's displaying 0 0.00, then you definitely know like, hey, there's no power going through the, uh, into the device and the device is just using a battery. Um, if the, if it's like one ampere or whatever, then you definitely know like, hey, the battery is charging. And even if you, if you, at some point, maybe a fast charging uh, working, which I don't think is supported yet in any device in Mela, uh, like on phones, uh, then you also can see this um, because otherwise you don't really know like um, how much power is going into it. And for Multiplex Steward, I recently got myself um, one of this headphone uh, USB-A breakout board, which is super useful because before I just cut up a cable and tried to solder things to it, but it was not really the, the best solution. And these breakout boards are super useful. There are also USB-C breakout boards, there are breakout boards for everything. Also headphone, headphone jack adapter, you can just buy them um, as you can see here. So just the bare metals and you can solder to it. And it's super, so much more useful than cutting up an existing cable. And your father was just talking about uh, phones. No, smartwatches are um, very similar, surprisingly similar to phones. Um, for example, all of the device, um, this, the, all the smartwatches here and, and many others are actually based on the Snapdragon 400 processor or SOC, um, which is, a, which is, a, basically a normal phone SOC that, um, that the down clocked and only enable one core in, mo in most cases. But yeah, if it runs Linux, then you can also port it to your smartwatch. Um, some new SS, um, some newer smartwatches. Um, they, by the way, the, these ones are from like kind of 2015. Um, these smartwatches from this era. Um, new ones use like dedicated Snapdragon Wear SSCs, where I don't really have any experience yet, like um, how similar they are to other um, SSCs. But if it's already supported, um, or if you already have some knowledge about mainlining, then these might be a great target. And <laughs> yeah, then you have. <laughs> Then you have mainland Linux running on the smartwatch. So um, to conclude, um, main learning is definitely not simple. It's definitely not fast. Um, you can spend years on, on one device and still miss many features. Um, even I am still, I don't know much about audio. I don't know much about cameras. Um, even IMMU, which is a, like a memory protection thing, I don't really understand because I yeah, I, I wasn't never super interested in it. Um, on a new device, I just copy like the, the correct identifier and then it works. Um, but I don't really know like what's going on there. So even after a long time, you don't understand much, but you, you learn so much all the time. And every hour you spend on it, you just know more afterwards. Yeah, for further resources, you can visit wiki.postmark.org.
um, which has super nice pages, um, kind of even mainlining guides for um, SOCs that already have good support. Um, there's a matrix channel, mainline, uh, hashtag mainline, um, colon postmarketers.org, um, where so many useful uh, and helpful people are that can help you with most of your problems, probably, hopefully. Um, there are also some other SC specific matrix channels or IOC channels. Um, yeah, thank you for watching. Now time for the Q&A. Thank you very much, um, Luca, for the very interesting talk and for the introduction, um, how to work towards mainland Linux. Um, also, really great summary um, of the tips. So some of them look familiar, but it's, um, I think, the best summary of, of things I've seen on, on two slides or something like that. That was it's really, really helpful. Um, um, let's start with the questions from the chat. Um, that's the first one from Dank12. Um, which was the most difficult thing to get um, working for you on mainline? And have you ever run into um, issues finding UART on your device? Um, so I would say that for um, Snapdragon 801, so basically Fairphone 2 and um, Nexus 5 error, um, it's basically still um, audio and IMMU isn't working yet. And it's like the display is super unstable there. So it's like something that has been in work, kind of work in progress for years. And somebody um, has often tried to get it working, but it never really worked out in the end. Okay, yeah, so some, some, some work left. Um, what is your favorite Qualcomm platform? Mm, I would say actually now the, um, um, the, the, snap, uh, the Snapdragon 750G used in the Fairphone 4 because it's uh, really new um, and it is, it is, it's very similar to like other high-end SOCs from that era, so from like the last two years. Um, it was really fun working on that because some parts just work so easily and aren't, yeah, don't um, pose too many problems there. Okay, because you basically have the baseline support in there from other earlier SOCs. Exactly. Yeah. And it's it's yeah. quite different from older SOCs in, in some parts um, because, yeah, Qualcomm changes uh, internally the hardware all the time, but, yeah. Okay. Um, have you ever bricked the device um, and couldn't ever figure out how to recover it? Um, I think actually just one device that's, as far as I can tell, is completely bricked, um, which is an LG phone, which, which has a super weird download mode and doesn't have fast boot and... Basically, I tried following some XDA threads from 2015 and um, unlocking the bootload and putting custom recovery there. And I didn't even manage that there. So, but on all the other phones, I have bricked some some ones a bit more, but then I recovered them by the air. So the emergency download mode. Okay. Um, I see. Just unfortunately, we only have one um, minute left. So maybe a short answer on: um, Can you recommend something about porting Linux to the high silicon Kirin platform? Um, not really, sorry, but, um, in general, like the hardware internally is, I think, relatively similar. So there's always a clock driver, there's always a regulated driver, there's always a pin control driver, but, um, the specifics of that, I really don't know, like much outside of Qualcomm and like some old MediaTek chip, but also not much there. Okay, th thank you again very much for your talk. And I think the channel is going to open for everyone. So the people with remaining questions, just join us and um, 